Well, thank you for joining us here on another edition of Business Week, where we zero in on the biggest news stories for the week, as well as engage in smart and global business conversations. I am Kelly Egiga, and I'm reaching you from Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. Well, thank you for joining us. Our focus today is on the state of Nigeria's economy. Well, again, the country is facing a lot of issues such as high inflation as experience, of course, globally. There are also issues around poverty, amongst others. We'll discuss some of these economic problems, causes, and the ways forward. This conversation, as usual, will take center stage in just a moment. But let's run you through some of the stories that trended earlier in the week. The presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, and his campaign team are in Lagos again, this time to meet with young business owners, entrepreneurs from the creative, agriculture, health, fintech, oil and gas, telecommunication sectors, and a host of others. The objective of this gathering is to hear firsthand from the young experts and understand their challenges, profile short medium and long-term solutions when he is elected president. Conveners of this event believe this platform gives the APC flag bearer an opportunity to further discuss the practicality of his manifesto ahead of the 2023 general elections. Thank you. To begin the process of policy formulation that we believe should put business at the core center under the leadership of Ashwaj Bola Ahmed Tinubu, that we're taking the liberty to share with you proud to this event the action plan of the standard bearer for your consideration review and as it relates to your various um, 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 interest and op operation and uh, area of operation and competencies consequently what we therefore expect from you here today is a feedback and your input indeed nigeria's economy has been challenged just like every other across the globe the message from the apc candidate is straight with the right team and cooperation from all concerned parties, Nigeria will surmount all these challenges. I've enjoyed you. I've enjoyed listening. What should happen is connecting the dots. What we must do and what we are here to do is to reflect the symbol on this cap. Break the shackle of poverty, ignorance, and failures. What I come to promise you is that this action will speak louder than my voice. After hours of intensive and constructive engagement, business leaders present here shared their thoughts on the outcome of the meeting. A low-hanging fruit that we must take advantage of, capitalize on it, and we're also, we have an international uh, 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 presence now with our entertainment and movies and music and all of that. If we can't track and bring that, you know, make it a success, leverage it and bring that money back by way of foreign direct or, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, bring back the, the investment, to bring it back here and create all over again and encourage the industry to, 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 to build. I think that um, we recorded overwhelming success. I think that um, the people who were in the room have heard it. Um, they've read it, I mean, first, because um, you, you remember that they kept referring to the manifesto. They've read it, they've heard it, and um, um, I believe that they are convinced and we'll see the results um, in February. Now, this is one of the strategic engagements of the All Progressives Congress presidential candidate, Ashwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu. And the focus here is around the economy, foreign exchange issues, policy issues that will enable small businesses and entrepreneurs thrive. According to him, he is ready to give renewed hope if elected president in 2023 and make sure that all of this becomes fruitful. Tolu Lokpe Ogunjobi, TVC News, Lagos. At his 28th governing council meeting, chaired by Abubakar Sani, the council commits to advancing a new approach to threat forwarding that stresses automation and seamless trade. 
part of what we discuss here is to see how we can better what we already have right now. In advanced world, you don't carry paper to start giving to customers and all this. Our aim is to get to where we can go to your computer and from there send your paper and then you don't have contact with people and then you do your operation and go. That is our target. And part of the resolutions we have today is the issue of uh, looking into the regulations that the council is using part of the, uh, as, uh, as part of the, the act that were deducted from the act of the governing council. So we look into that one and the committee was formed to harmonize some of the regulations we have like the one of 2010, the one of 2018 and, and 19. And that one also will go to a greater extent in, in, in giving a, a, a kind of new direction to how the fair forwarding business is going to be uh, continued in, in this country. Additionally, they are utilizing technology to ensure effective application of the practitioner's operating fee collection system which is still in the process of being fully integrated across all entry points. What we are doing is to ensure that there is enforcement, 100% enforcement. We are not doing these things manually. It's an online thing we do. Okay, at the seaport, we are, we are pleased with what is happening there because enforcement is going on. At the airport, we are airports in the country, we are yet to integrate with uh, NCAA, um, because of that, we have not taken off. Uh, border posts, you know the level of insecurity in the country, and the border was also shut down for a while. Okay, so for that, we have not been able to enforce border post works. The council insists that practitioners' operating fees must be paid before cargoes exit the port. Ifunanya Eze, TVC News, Lagos. You're welcome back and thanks for staying with us here on Business Week. Now let's head on to our big, big conversation. Following the pandemic-induced recession in 2020, Nigeria's economic growth recovered, but microeconomic stability weakened amidst global commodity shocks, uh, depreciating currency trade restrictions and monetization of the deficit. Inflation is surging and pushing millions of Nigerians into poverty. Since 2021, Nigeria is also unable to benefit from the surging global oil prices as oil production in the country has fallen to historic lows and petrol subsidy continues to consume a larger share of the gross oil revenues. And while the economy is projected to grow at an average of 3.2% in 2022, the growth outlook is subject to downside risks, including further declines in oil production and heightened insecurity. And speaking to some of these issues, earlier of the week, I had an exclusive conversation with a former chairman, Senate Committee on Finance, and a three-term member of the House of Representatives, Senator John Owaneno. Here's that conversation. Distinguished Senator John Owaneno, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, Senator. I, mean, I will engage your views and perspective on a number of national issues. But because you were the, uh, the, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, uh, l let's begin uh, with the state of Nigeria's economy. It's been almost eight years of the administration of the All Progressive Congress, your party. How would you describe uh, the growth of the Nigerian economy or just how much growth have we recorded the past eight years? Well, I mean, it's, um, it's um, maybe without going too far into how many years now, maybe we should just um, look at the present world situation where a lot of economies are actually achieving negative GDP growth, going into recession. I mean, it's um, without prejudice to what anybody wants to say and wants to feel. You discover that almost for the third consecutive quarter, the Nigerian economy is recording a positive GDP growth rate. The Nigerian economy is not in recession, in spite of the global recession that is going on. So there must be something that is going on. There must be something that is growing and that is enabling that economy not to go into recession. We may not have achieved the kind of growth that was very optimistically expected you know, within the life of this administration, 
But the managers of Nigeria's present economy have also done a fine job in making sure that we continue to experience a positive GDP growth rate compared to other, you know, national, other international, other, other, other countries of the world. Let's, let's turn to the oil and gas sector, for instance. There's a serious uh, fuel crisis right now in many parts of the country. I mean, long queues have emerged uh, across the country. Um, you were at the Senate for four years. Paint a picture of what exactly some of the issues are. You know, you recall that, um, again, within the life of this administration, um, especially at the beginning, it almost got to celebration point when the perennial fuel queues and fuel crisis, you know, wasn't occurring anymore, if you recall. Um, but we've lost, long lost that. I mean, it's, um, the, uh, the matter is remaining almost intractable. Uh, not so much because, you know, of this administration, but because of, well, a few other variables that have continued to play a trick in terms of our ability as an administration as an, and as a country and as a government, you know, to completely solve that. Um, the, the crisis that is occurring, you know, in the Russian and Ukraine region is, 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 is a factor in terms of what is going on now. But in terms of, you know, what aspect of it is, a bit internal and domestic, you know, I think that, you know, our governments, you know, former, present, have been, have been addressing the issue of subsidy, you know, with kid gloves, more or less, you know, because of how, how much of a bad picture it almost paints an administration, as if, you know, we've come to, you know, continue to appreciate the fact that when you, you stop well subsidy, you know, too many things escalate, and therefore it touches the common man, you know, a bit more. So governments don't want to, don't want to experience the kind of public outcry and outrage over withdrawal of public subs, you know, fuel subsidy. As we've continued to do so, it has also continued to play a trick in terms of our ability to be on top of a continuous flow of fuel and, you know, fuel queues and things like that. You know, to the extent that, uh, you know, um, if you check the last, the, last, the last figure we're given about fuel, you know, how much government was spending, you know, to subsidize fuel, it's, it's scandalous. It's scandalous. You know, so one of the things that I say in here is that I think there is also a connection between withdrawal of fuel subsidy, right, and taking care and addressing fundamentally and once and for all the issue of fuel queues. You know, because, you know, as long as importers of fuel don't have a chance to sell their fuel at commercial rates, that is how it remains a disincentive towards importing fuel. And therefore, that is how long it will continue to be. You know, so what I'm saying, therefore, is that, you know, there is an aspect that is global. There's nothing that we can do. There's, one, there's also an aspect that is internal. There's something we can do, but it requires hard decisions. Incidentally, such a hard decision is being left for the next administration to take. Because the present administration has given a date where it's going to stop subsidizing fuel. That date, incidentally, is coming almost at the end of its lifespan. You know, so tough decisions need to be taken. And I expect that next government, that administration, to take such a If I was going to ask you which side of the divide you belong to as regards uh, this issue around fuel subsidy controversy, are you for it or against it? Well, I don't know what you mean by for it or against it. If it's in terms of whether I support the removal of fuel subsidy, I support it totally. I support it totally because, you know, on the one hand, it is, it is fraudulent. On the one hand, you know, some people are just feeding fat as we continue to subsidize fuel. You know, don't forget, maybe, I mean, when I was in the House of Reps, you know, in my third term, I think, in the House of Reps, um, I was a member of 
the committee that was then headed by Honorable Farouk Lawan that investigated fuel subsidy payments. I took over as the chairman of that, of that subsidy committee. You know, so I'm pretty familiar with, with the issues surrounding fuel subsidy and surrounding, you know, all that. You know, first, like we've continued to be told by the experts that should know, that the volume of fuel consumption daily that is recorded in the books of government is way out of what the real thing is. And at the only time you can have that correct number of vehicles and how much volume is consumed within this country is when you, when you remove fuel subsidy, when there's no gain anymore to be made from subsidizing fuel. So I mean it totally. And I think that going forward, that's better for our country, even in terms of the huge revenues, the huge expenditure that is being put into subsidized fuel that should rather be taken to fund other sectors more critical to the life of Nigerians. Let me just engage you on something else that has to do with um, our budget uh, over the years. I mean, you have witnessed budget presentations by uh, the current administration, Mr. President, and even pre uh, the previous uh, president. You have also uh, scrutinized ministries, departments, and agencies, MDAs, uh, scrutinized their, their budget defense as well. In terms of performance of our budget as a country and as a nation, how would you describe um, that, just to add to it the fact that when you also look at the current budget for 2023 as presented by President Muhammad Buhari, how concerned and how worried are you? Uh, well, without prejudice to the particular budgets, you know, within our country, you know, budgets are normally generally statements of intents, right, expectations and what you want to do. I mean, I expect that within 2023, I'm going to be able to have available, you know, to me in terms of the monies, let's say about one billion. I expect that, you know, um, I'm going to be able to have access to some, some loans, you know, multilateral loans and all that, X, Y, Z. And I put this, you know, together. And I say, okay, because of what I expect, I'm going to come, it's going to come as revenue. I'm going to spend X, Y, Z. And it gets to 2023. You know, first, you know, the success of that budget is going to depend on whether those expectations are met or not. Once those expectations are not met, of course, it has some telling effect in terms of the ability that anybody has, whether government, whether individual. So in terms of our budgets over the years, uh, and I think that I'm in a good position to also, you know, interrogate this. At some point, while, when I spent 12 years in the House of Reps, within that period, you know, for about two years, I was deputy chairman in the Committee on Appropriation. For about four years, I was chairman, Committee on Appropriation. You know, so, I mean, I sat on the national budget. You know, so it, it's, um, it's, um, it's um, budget implementation has always been a problem. Largely because of, you know, unrealized revenues. And these revenues are not realized. Why? The chunk of our expectations in terms of revenues has always been based on how much oil we are able to produce each day and how much we are able to sell. If you go and project, for example, in 2023, you're going to have about 2.1 million barrels of crude daily. And 2023 comes, and what you find out that on average, you're just doing 1 million barrels. Of course, it cast it down in terms of the ability to implement that budget. Now, our domestic revenue mobilization remains a challenge. I mean, internally generated revenue. I remember as chairman commission on finance at some point in the House of Reps, I chaired an investigative hearing on internally generated revenue, and we discovered that so much wasn't being remitted. You know, so the discipline to remit revenues generated by MDs has continued to be a challenge. I mean, how many years since after the introduction of VAT? VAT collection is not yet automated. So there's a lot that is lost. So a lot of these things have to be taken into consideration in terms of having to now determine, you know, how the ability of our budgets, what our budgets doing like, how much releases are coming. So at the end of the day, let's say for education, you budget about X, Y, Z amount. And at the end of the day, maybe only just about half of that amount has been released. You know, so you find out that the other challenge has to do with, you know, funding for capital budget, you know, recurrent budget. 
you know, and things like that. The chunk of our budget and our revenues these days, in the most recent years, has been devoted to funding, you know, consumption, uh, you know, rather than expending, you know, funding capital, what is productive. So a lot of these things come in together, and so there is no particular yardstick to determine how well our budgets are doing or how badly they are doing. You need to be able to look at it in terms of an examination of each of these strands that I've tried to throw up before you, you're able to actually appreciate what we're doing. All right, let's talk politics for a moment. 2023 is around the corner. and Your party has presented a candidate in a former senator and two-term governor of Lagos State, Nigeria's commercial capital, and Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu. Talk to us from that window about his person or personality and as well his economic blueprint as we, we, we run close to the elections. I mean, people say that um, he perhaps laid the basis or foundation for what is today a successful and growing economy in Lagos, one of the fastest growing in Africa, the continent. I think that for our party, the APC, we couldn't have had a better choice. I mean, in Senator Bola Ahmed Tinubu, we have an incredibly able candidate. We have someone whose name recognition it's, you know, goes beyond, you know, way above almost every other name. And in politics, you need that first, first name recognition. He's got it. I mean, he's paid his price, you know, for all of us that are today enjoying the dividends of democracy. He's one of those that put his life on the line for it. You know, so even if it's like payback, even if it's like payback, uh, you know, it's, it's actually a payback period for him. He's built alliances across the length and breadth of this country. I mean, if as far back as is it 1993 or 1992 or so, we're talking about MKO and the rave about MKO as far back as then. I mean, the relationship that he has, the transcend party. And that's why you can talk about somebody like Senator Ken Namani in Enugu State, right? Not minding the fact that although he's a seven PDP senator, not minding the fact that his name is appearing in the PCC, Presidential Campaign Council for Bola Metinubu. And, and you know, so, so, so on that, I mean, is it about his, his, his credentials as former Lagos governor? It, it's, um, the other cities across the country that are almost you know, strategically that located, whose state governors would have been able to use those cities to build an economy around that state? And I'm going to mention those states, but we know them. You know, so the fact that Tinubu made what he made out of Lagos and it's continued to be stands him out as somebody who's got the credentials, who's prepared for that job that Nigerians want. You know, so it's, um, it's um, not to talk about the blueprint that he has come up with that touches almost every facet of our lives, almost every facet that we need to release its productive, you know, the potentials. I mean, is it, is, it, is, it, is it small and medium scaled enterprises? Is it local revenue, you know, mobilization? In the other day, you know, my one time executive chairman of the Federal Revenue Service, Fowler, uh, you know, who, Babatune Fowler, who had started doing this job when Tinubu was governor of Lagos. And he climbed up and became the executive chairman of FIRS at the national level when he was talking about, you know, how the journey in Lagos started. You know, so if Nigeria's greatest challenge is our inability to, you know, to, to be able to generate the kinds of revenues that we, that we have the potentials for internally as a country, the right man for that job as president of the country is Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And it's a fine place to perhaps anchor our conversation with you, distinguished Senator John Owaneno. Thank you indeed for your insights and perspective on the program. Thank you, Kelly. And that exclusive chat with a former chairman, Senate Committee on Finance, and a three-term member of the House of Representatives, Senator John Owaneno, does it for us here on this edition of Business Week. Many thanks indeed for watching. I'll see you again next time. Bye now.